The door to mystery is open. <gasps> Macabre Hill. Macabre Hill. Macabre. Hello and welcome. I'm Mark Lindsay, proprietor of the house on Macabre Hill. Yes, that's right. This is that house, the sprawling Victorian mansion. It's got the crumbling roof, the sagging porch, the paint peeling from the sides of it like old dead skin. Now you remember that spooky old place where when you walk by, it's as if the windows are dark, dead eyes watching your every move. You call this dilapidated old place blood chilling, eerie, ugly. Me? I call it home. And tonight, Mikasa is Sukasa. Together, you and I, here in what we ironically call the living room, will take a peek into the darker recesses of the Kansas City area. During the next hour of Macabre Hill, we'll reach out to Southwest Missouri, where something bright and shiny wanders the pitch black of night. We'll talk to folks who'll be delighted to take you where no one rests in peace. We'll go to the most haunted city in Kansas where the season draws people and the ghosts draw blood. We'll chat with the operators of the largest haunted house in the nation. And when they say haunted house, this time they mean it. We'll talk with an author who will help us go back in time to the 1870s in Kansas to the Little Death House on the prairie. And perhaps we'll share a few songs that require you keep the musical beat, but not a heartbeat. These are the kinds of things you find in the attic, under the floorboard, lurking behind every door here at the house on Macabre Hill. Let's get started, shall we? If you stop by the John Warnell House on Warnell Road, please respect the no smoking signs. And if you see a Civil War soldier lounging on the landing of the stairs having a smoke break, please remind him of that rule. The dead seem to have no manners. When the Pickman family moves into their dream house, their future seems bright. Until the ghost of a troubled child intrudes. Unearthly visions and violent attacks expose an evil force and fury brewing for centuries. It just grabbed my arm and just yanked me. What? Oh my God, look at my arms. An investigation of cemetery records from the late 19th century reveals that a young girl named Sally did indeed live in the Pickman's house. She died at the age of seven. The excerpts you just heard were from a TV show called A Haunting. It's from the Discovery Channel. What's really interesting to discover is that this show was about a house not far from yours, just a short drive north in Atchison, Kansas. That's the city often described as the most haunted city in Kansas. And if you want to see all the spooky spots, the way to do it is by taking a trip on Haunted Atchison. To talk about that, I've got Jason Nichols here. He's the Director of Communications for the Chamber of Commerce. Jason, this tour covers so many haunted places in Atchison. I think that's the, the neat thing about the tour is we've got such a wealth of residences, parks, places with some paranormal history and much of it documented that you really get a chance to see you know, the whole gamut of paranormal activity. One of them is Jackson Park. Um, that's one of the favorites of most people that take the tour. Uh, we actually drive our trolley through the park, through the woods, and tell the story about Molly, who supposedly jumped to her death after her boyfriend broke up with her. And supposedly, if you're in the park in the evening, you can hear her screams. One of the neat places in town is called the McIntyre Villa. Um, one of the stories is that the light in the tower will come on. Well, it's odd because there's no light and no power in the tower. Tell us about the most famous house we heard a little bit about it earlier at the start of this uh, this interview the Sally House the, the home is actually owned by a private individual in town who has rented the home out from time to time unfortunately he's, he's had trouble keeping people in the home which I guess is understandable considering uh, it's a uh, hauntings and a long history of paranormal activity so and it's really one of the most sought after destinations for 
for people interested in the paranormal. Let, let's describe some of the things that happened in the house. A, a young couple bought it. They had uh, just had a baby. One of the first things that was a giveaway in the house was that the children's toys would rearrange on the floor in a circle when no one had been up there. And eventually it went from that to something much more violent. This is one place where there's actually documented physical contact with a living person. You know, there might be a hundred people that go through the home and we hear new things every week. You know, somebody took a picture, they see a figure on the stairway in the window, they see the, um, they, they arrange the toys in, in Sally's old bedroom and when they come back they're moved, even though the room is roped off. Jan Wessel, the tourism coordinator for the Chamber of Commerce in Atchison, has had her own experiences in that house. Jan, what happened with you? Well, it was one of my very first visits to the Sally House um, as, as a chamber representative. And right before a tour, we always go in and make sure the house is clean, make sure everything's hanging up where it should be. And up in the upstairs room, in the, in the child's room, we put toys around in a circle. So I, I was setting it up right, and I had left the room to go ask this other person something, and then I had gone back, and one of the toys had moved to the middle of the circle. But it's, it's not a wood floor or anything that would be slick. It's carpet. Right. And uh, I was like, oh, my God. So I immediately grabbed the other person and said, we're out of here. When I uh, had gotten back and I was talking about it to some of the people here, they said, oh, well, we've heard that same story before with some of the volunteers that had gone up to do the same thing. So ever since then, when I, when I go over there before we have a, an, a home tour or something, I take someone with me. There was absolutely no one else uh, in the house, at least no one physically. <laughs> Tonight is pretty much the last night of Haunted Atchison Tours. Now, it does go on during the summer. We do tours traditionally once a month in the summer. We start them up uh, in mass uh, the first Saturday in September, and then fairly regular. You know, they're definitely every weekend. If, if people have a, a large tour, you could probably help them, even during the non-prime times of the year. Sure, we can, we can work with, with large groups of people. You can call us at 800-234-1854, or you can email tours at atchisonkansas.net. Some of the sites on the Haunted Tour are even open to the public. The Santa Fe Depot, the Cray Historical Home Museum are both on the tour and, and available for people to go in throughout the year. Check out AtchisonKansas.net or log on to HauntedAtchison.com. You can even become a paranormal investigator for a night and join in on the fun of ghost hunting. Now, if you're interested in the Sally House in specific, check out PrairieGhosts.com. There you can see the original picture taken so many years ago, looking up the stairs, right at the Sally Ghost. Coming up next on Macabre Hill, we'll take a peek inside a local industry that you pay to bring your worst nightmares to life, and we'll check out how you can check out guided tours of the truly haunted. Macabre Hill will be back, quite possibly, from the dead. Into the crypt they creep, into the dark they seep, ever the wanderers weep, at the house on Macabre Hill. <laughs> on the road again. Just can't wait to get on the road again. A lot of people talk about going on a day trip. You don't drive too far to do the things you enjoy. If you enjoy things that scare you, you'll want to talk to Beth Cooper of Ghost Tours of Missouri. Her website is groovyghost.com, but her destination is the macabre. Beth, you've already done all the hard work of finding the spooky places that are fairly nearby. I have, and we have ghost tours in a lot of different towns, and we go door-to-door to small businesses and public buildings, and we ask them, do you have a ghost? And you would be amazed at how many of these folks tell us their ghost stories. People love to open up about this stuff, and people love to hear about it. Apparently, since 2003, these ghost tours in Missouri, you guys have been doing pretty well. I'm heading into my ninth year now of doing these tours, and it's pretty amazing because we originally started the tours here in Topeka, and uh, we decided, you know what, Topeka has the most famous ghost around, and that's the albino lady of North Topeka, and I'm a native North Topekan, so we decided, okay, let's tell some stories about the albino lady, and what we found out is there are a lot of ghosts, not just the albino lady, 
There are ghosts at the state capitol. There are ghosts on downtown Kansas Avenue. There are ghosts all over the place. And so we started to expand the tours. And we went into Lawrence and Leavenworth, Manhattan, Holton. And we realized there are ghosts all over the place. Literally ghosts everywhere. And I decided, you know... Missouri does not have very many ghost tours, and so I decided I think we're ready to start up in Missouri. So we started doing tours in Liberty and Excelsior Springs and Lexington, which I really consider to be the most haunted city in Missouri. Really? Lexington? Oh, you would not believe the amazing stories that are in Lexington. I have never had so many strange stories. Well, you've got quite a list. If uh, people go to groovyghost.com, they can go through links to get to a list of the uh, uh, the cities where you do tours. You've got uh, uh, cities where you currently do tours, and then ones we can look forward to. I'm sure Dodge City will be amazing. We only do public buildings. We do not do private homes or right. urban myths and legends. So these are very authentic ghost stories. You mentioned that you don't do urban myths, so you actually vet your ghost stories. And to help you do that, I saw on the website that you've got help from a paranormal research investigator. Yeah, Nick Spankus. Uh, Nick is pretty famous regionally. Uh, he has done investigations uh, before the ghost hunters guys were there. He did an investigation of the Missouri State Penitentiary in Jefferson City. Official investigation team to go into Missouri State Penitentiary. He was also the first paranormal investigation team to go into the second most haunted building in Missouri, which is the Belvoir Winery, the Odd Fellows building in Liberty. You mentioned earlier that Lexington comes across to you as the most haunted city in Missouri. What what is it about? It is it the amount of stories, or <laughs> or yeah, come on, throw throw me some yes. evidence oh, here. I what what, what made crazy. it so haunted? Uh, at at uh, the military academy, Wentworth Military Academy. Yes, which I believe was uh, the first military school west of the Mississippi River. It the ghosts there actually go home with the staff. <laughs> they attach. To employees and they go home with them. Uh, Some of the other stories we have include Block 42, which was the old brothel district, and then we have the Saluda explosion. It was a steamboat that in the 1850s the boiler went dry as it was rounding the bend there on the Missouri River at Lexington and exploded and literally body parts rained down upon the city. That's quite the little historical footnote, if you'll yeah, forgive the pun. Yeah, that is. But let's also throw in a battlefield. The Battle of Lexington was right. the largest battle west of the Mississippi. Uh, the Anderson House, the well went dry, so they threw body parts in there uh, during the battle because they didn't have anywhere else to put the... Uh, when they used the building as a surgery. Now, I, of course, have a question for you. You uh, you have been running this business for this long. You've, you've written a couple of books. Uh, yes. There's uh, The Ghosts of Kansas, and you had one come out just in September of this year, uh, Wichita Haunts. Tell us yes. about that a little bit. Both books feature stories from the ghost tours, and it actually includes a lot more uh, historic background that we include on the tours and more, what would you call it, more technical data or information about the investigations. And we only do authentic haunted locations so people could actually buy the book and use it as a tour guide. They can go into these places, their businesses, their public buildings. And you do these tours pretty much year-round. Yes, there's a real misperception. People believe that ghosts only come out at Halloween. And the reality is we've had more ghost experiences during our tours in the summertime. We usually take a break in November, December, January. That's also a great time for us to develop the new tours in our new tour cities. Visit GroovyGhost.com, pick a city, go and see the scariest things you can. Ghosts that go home with patrons at River House, a haunted fraternity in Manhattan, a ghostly grandpa at a hardware store in Shawnee. This is all available to you year-round at GroovyGhost.com with Beth Cooper. Get out there and get scared. When you enter the hallowed doors of St. Mary's Episcopal Church at 1307 Holmes, you might see Father Henry David Jardine making his rounds inside this house of worship. Though several people have seen him pray, the last people to see him breathe were in 1886, the year they laid him to rest by the organ under the church's high altar. Yeah, yeah. 
In the Kansas City area, we have many things to be proud of. A great heritage, the beauty of the Midwest, and some of the biggest, baddest, and best haunted houses in America. All owned and operated by one company that seems to have the patent on pure terror. To tell us more about how much scare you can get in one night, we have Amber Beckwith. She is the vice president of Full Moon Productions. And Amber, you've got four amazing locations, plus even more that you can do to be scared here in Kansas City. That's right. Um, One of the unique things that people living here in Kansas City um, need to know is that haunted attractions actually originated right here in our hometown. The Edge of Hell is celebrating its 37th season and is the oldest commercial haunted attraction in the United States. And so that's definitely something um, I don't think most people realize. And then in 1991, we built the Beast, which is considered... America's largest and best haunted attraction. It pioneered the open format, which is very, very unique within the industry. Um, But it also continued our work and research in regards to um, the psychology of fear and working with people's phobias. And so inside the beast, it's all about the phobia of being lost and being able to find your way out. And then in 2007, we embarked on a whole new adventure. We're working with Kansas City's Dream Factory to benefit critically and terminally ill children. And that was um, the inspiration behind the Chambers of Edgar Allan Poe, which is a literary walkthrough of his writings. And it's also very unique in that it is our haunted attraction that has been monitored by the Discovery Channel and proven to have paranormal activity. We've even had employees that um, won't go back to work inside that building because they say that ghost can be physical. Last but not least is our nod to classic and contemporary horror, which is the macabre cinema. And so if you're a scary movie fan, then this attraction is for you. It's a haunted 1930s movie theater. You pass through a slit in the screen as you watch a scary movie, and then you are the victim within the movie sets. And we have the original Hellraiser set, which is the pinhead character, as well as the mummy, the scorpion king, um, actually from the movies, are on display inside macabre cinema. It's not just walking through, looking at something. There's the stereotypical haunted houses that, you know, have the boo from out of a corner. Yours are so much different because as a person who goes into them, you literally become part of them. I think because we are um, the originator, we always continue to push the envelope and look at new ways to interact with the customer, but also to work with that psychology. What are the reasons that people are are more vulnerable whenever they have to bend bend over to crawl through a fireplace, for instance, or if they're in a place and can't find their way out, how does that affect them? When you go through the attractions, all of those things are planned down to the detail in order for them to work based upon their particular theme and how the layout um, is put together and planned. Inside, um, Poe is a complete recreation of his gravesite on the fourth floor. All the tombstones are the same, they're turned in the same direction, the names are the same. And so it's, it's creating those details to capitalize on the illusions that then come back to people's psychology. It's your own adrenaline that you bring to the table Um, the kind of the flight or fight method um, that is innate within all of us. And that's what that's what we work with in order um, to have a lot of fun. So basically, you've gone inside our minds, figured out what we're terrified of, and then you've pulled it out, put it in there and let us experience it outside. Well done, you. And everyone's different. It's very unique because when you pass through a particular scene or um, you're on their attraction, you're strapped in. And so everything with the timing happens absolutely perfectly. But within our environment, every single person scares differently and you're not strapped in. And so that makes our job even harder. It is very detail oriented and of course has evolved over 37 years of doing this. Your experiences, they're not two minutes, three minutes. We're not even talking 10 minutes. These things take, (laughs) what, a half an hour to almost an hour, depending upon how fast you walk? Absolutely, how fast you walk. Some people crawl, some people run, some people sacrifice their girlfriends, some people pee their pants. Everybody scares differently, and it depends on the phobias. And so people say, well, I want to know which one's the best. I want to know 
which one you like the best, which would be like picking one of the best child out of my four children that I have. I can't do that. Full Moon Productions has put so much into these houses, and uh, to to even call them a house is almost demeaning because they are they are these full sensory experiences. The Beast is America's largest haunted house, and you have just had the Guinness Book of World Records come out to measure what? Well, we are very excited about our new star at the edge of hell. Her name is Medusa. And she is the largest living reticulated python in captivity ever. And so Guinness has just been out to award that. And we will be in the Guinness Book of World Records with Medusa um, for the 2013 edition. She, um, she weighs 350 pounds. And it takes 16 men just to pick her up and hold her. You can get tickets to all four or get tickets separately. The websites are easy to remember. KCBeast.com, ChambersofPoe.com, EdgeofHell.com, MacabreCinema.com. You know, these are um, only open during the Halloween season. We, we usually open in September and we run through Halloween. We will also be open the first weekend in November, 4th and 5th. But if you would like to... Um, Peek into the chambers of Edgar Allan Poe and experience the ghost yourself. There is the full moon ghost hunt that runs year-round, as well as Kansas City's Ghosts and Gangsters Tour, which is a two-and-a-half-hour bus tour of the paranormal, civil war, and gangster history in Kansas City. You've set the noose and you keep raising it. We say at Full Moon Productions that our applause comes in the form of screams, but it also comes with lots of laughter. We'll shed a little light on something spooking Joplin next on Macabre Hill. There's a place between heaven and hell where truth and myth become an act of will. Macabre Hill. If you drive down south of Joplin to check out the Joplin Spook Light, you can be one of those people that saw the light. Of course, there is one small detail. You don't know what this light is. With us right now is the president of the Ghost Research Society. He's the editor of the journal and author of Windy City Ghosts, uh, Windy City Ghosts 2. He's got a field guide to spirit photography, which might come in very useful if you love this kind of thing. And illuminating the darkness, the mystery of spook lights. Dale Kazmarek has been researching ghosts and phenomena for decades. I take it this isn't just a hobby. You actually do this as a scientific investigation. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we always try to rule out natural explanations along the way. We don't always jump to the conclusion that what we see or we come across or reports that we get from people is necessarily a ghost. We, we look at all the aspects of the phenomena and we, we try to investigate it with the latest in scientific technology that we do use. Ghostresearch.org is Dale's website. You can see his books there, you can learn about techniques, you can also read about his experience with the Joplin spook light. Now, Dale, that's not the only spook light out there. Throughout the United States, there's probably a good, uh, even a couple of hundred. Uh, in, in my book, The Illumining the Darkness Mystery Spook Lights, I was able to come across uh, quite a number. Um, many of these I personally investigated. I uh, was able to go to the site, do some research, and actually have these personal experiences myself. There's not a, a natural explanation for them. That they're not car head, headlights, which is often the theory behind a lot of these spook lights. They're car light reflections or, or tail lights. In that case, it doesn't hold up here. There can be sometimes... Uh, stories actually documented uh, that have some validity to them. Uh, I've actually seen a lot of these spook lights myself personally, and I've actually debunked a few that have been naturally explainable. If you're thinking about doing your own research, you can go to ghostresearch.org and get a map for the Joplin spook light. Dale, where's the best place to view it? The best observation point is actually the uh, Missouri-Oklahoma border. So the light is actually seen closer to Quapa, uh, Oklahoma. And people that have seen that light throughout the years, uh, seen it from anything from a yellow light to an uh, orange to a white light. When I was there, the first time I saw the light was actually back in uh, September of 1982, Memorial Day weekend, when I was out there doing investigating. We were out there with a group of researchers. Uh, we had some high-powered binoculars. Uh, we were looking for the light. We had an encounter that I thought was very unusual. Uh, what we actually saw... Uh, was not so much a ball of light through the binoculars, but it would look like a triangular-shaped object with a hollow center that you can actually see through. And you can see the trees and bushes through this object. It went down behind these hills. If, if you 
uh, familiar with the road, it's a series of like rolling hills. Every time it went down behind one of these hills, it left behind kind of like little pinpoints of phosphorescent light, like luminosity behind, little twinkles of light like fireflies kind of dancing around. When we finally got to the top of the last hill, and it was no, no farther away than about 70 feet at the closest observation, just a few seconds later, it was then about a mile and a half down the road. So it had gotten from 70 feet to a mile and a half away. It was quite an amazing encounter. This has been investigated by a number of different groups uh, throughout the years. The Army Corps of Engineers has been out there. The University of Michigan has been out there. Uh, the Joplin Globe has been out there in the past with newspaper reporters, and nobody seems to, to know what it is. You shake my nerves and you rattle my brain. Too much love drives a man insane. You broke my will, but what a thrill. Goodness gracious, great balls of fire. 71 can take you to the Joplin spook light, but if you take 13 south, you can get to Branson, Missouri, where you just might bump into a wonderful little lady named Joanne. She's joined us tonight to share her experience with the Joplin spook light, an up-close and personal experience. This was right at 1955. I was at work, I was a cocktail waitress, and there was a group there, and they all said they were talking about the spook light, which, of course, I didn't leave a word of, so I had to have proof. <laughs> And we loaded up. There were four of us, two boys, two girls. Uh, I and my date sat in the back of the car, and we went to Joplin. They found out by asking here and there where this light was located. So we pull up on this road, and we park, and there's absolutely nothing there. And, you know, I'm getting ready to tell them <laughs> how the cow eats the cabbage. All of a sudden, way far in front of us, there comes this light walking down the opposite side of the road. It's coming right at us. Joanne, when you say walking down the road, what do you mean? How was the light moving? It was moving in a rhythm like a person carrying a lantern. So we wait, and the light continues to come right down the road, right at our car. There's no body there. And as it came up to the car, the other kids are really scared now. Jody, how old would you say the people were in the car at that time? Okay, I was 22. They had to be over 21 because, like I said, I was a cocktail waitress. So you're a group of really pretty young people out there getting this yeah. this thrill. But and did we you see we something? we were real adults. But oh, of those course. three were so scared, they died into the car. This light came up on top of the car, the hood of the car, right up to the front windshield and shone in on all four of us. I still don't believe what I'm seeing, but they're scared to death. They're ducking again. They're going, the light, it doesn't hurt your so eyes. You're actually it looking is. into this, in, into this light. It, it's that close that... They could have reached up and touched it. It was a big, round light. Was it blinding you? Mind? Wasn't it hard to look at? You know, that was, no. You could look right into this brilliant white light. It did not hurt your eyes. You could look at each other. We could see everything clearly. Look right at this blinding, beautiful white light that didn't bind. They got a right to call it a spook light. So this comes now, right up to that front windshield. Everybody else is hiding. They duck down and they're trying to pull me down and I'm not going to go down. I got this. But then, all of a sudden, the light is not there anymore. I felt it behind me. No heat, no nothing. I just knew there was a something, and I turned around, and that light was directly behind me, looking me smack in the eyes out through the rear window, because I'm in the passenger seat of the rear seat. They were looking at it, too, but they were starting the car. So there are the four of you, four young people in this car, this light has appeared right behind you, and pandemonium is breaking out. Yeah, they were screaming, but they were driving. So you actually pulled away from it? Yeah, we left it standing out there in the middle of the road. Did you ever talk it's, with them about it after after that event? No. It's as though uh, we were afraid to talk to each other about this thing we'd seen. I've often wondered if that light remembers me. Coming up next on Macabre Hill, for this family of four, their manifest destiny was murder and music to soothe the savage, non-beating heart. Stick around for the final breath of Macabre Hill. Stop it! Help me! There's no escaping the truth. Leave me alone! There's no escaping... 
Macabre Hill. Have you ever just gotten in your car, pointed it down the road, and driven just to see what's there? I love to, and I have a Macabre Hill recommendation for you. Take Highway 7, 169 South out of Kansas City. Keep going further, further, until you reach the US 400 and US 169 interchange in Labette County. There's a rest stop there. Pull in, find the Kansas historical marker, and realize as you read the following words, you're standing one mile away from where it happened. On the high prairie a mile northwest beyond the nearby mounds which bear their name, the Bender family, John, his wife, son, and daughter Kate, in 1871 built a small house. They partitioned it into two rooms by a canvas cloth. It had a table, stove, and grocery shelves in front. In back were beds, a sledgehammer, and a trap door above a pit-like cellar. Kate, a self-proclaimed healer and spiritualist, and reported to be a beautiful, voluptuous girl with tigerish grace, was the leading spirit of her murderous family. The house was located on the main road. Travelers stopping for a meal were seated on a bench, back tight against the canvas. In the next two years, several disappeared. When suspicions were finally aroused in 1873, the Benders fled. A search of their property disclosed 11 bodies buried in the garden, skulls crushed by hammer blows through the canvas. The end of the Benders is not known. The earth seemed to swallow them as it had their victims. There's a book titled Death for Dinner, The Benders of Old Kansas, a biography of a family of mass killers. The author is Phyllis De La Garza, who is kind enough to join us tonight. Phyllis is a prolific writer of both fiction and non-fiction books, plus short stories, magazine articles, and more. Now, Phyllis, the Benders had been killing people for months. They had this pretty well down pat. Where did they go wrong? I believe that they made the mistake when they killed Dr. York. He, he was a physician, a medical doctor in that area, and he was well known. And he was on a riding trip through that area, and he just disappeared. And uh, Dr. York had a brother who was a, a Kansas State Senator, and Senator York also was a Civil War veteran and a man of action, everyone said. Senator York gathered up a posse and rode uh, all through that area trying to follow the trail of his brother. And they got into the area where the Bender uh, farm was. Senator York and the posse went over to the Bender place and started questioning them. And I believe the Benders, they realized that someone that they couldn't play games with, that's when they decided that they had they better uh, get out while they could. Well, a week went by before anyone realized that the farm was abandoned, and then they converged on the place. They found this bloody thing in the house and the trap door behind the kitchen table and all that kind of thing. How did they find the bodies? That was, um, every, all the bodies that they found were in the apple orchard. The, uh, a gentleman stood on a buggy, and yes. he happened to notice some odd-colored patches down there in that haphazard orchard. He noticed a depression in the ground when he stood up on the back of the buggy that, you know, a sunken area that was like shaped like a grave would be. And so they went over there and they used the wagon rods and they poked into the ground and they started to shovel. And Dr. York, he was the first one that they found. They continued to dig in other places and there were, uh, I believe, eight bodies were eventually dug up from the, out in the orchard, including uh, one man and his little, his little daughter. That is the most horrible one of them all. The little girl was still alive when they threw her father's body on top of her. These people belonged in a modern horror movie. And just like in a modern horror movie, they seem to have melted away into the darkness. Right. Now, in your book, Death for Dinner, The Benders of Old Kansas, you uh, you do painstaking research to tell the story of how they came out to the West, who they are, what their real relationships were, because no one believes that they were actually parents and children. Most likely, Ma and Pa Bender were a couple. They were probably married. And, this, and John Bender, who was 25 years old, that would have fit as far as his being a son of theirs. Right. And then they passed Katie off as the daughter, but she she was the wife of John Bender Jr. What do you think happened with the younger two? I, I think the older two just, well, they, they got away. There, there were some detectives uh, that were hired by uh, Senator York, and they uh, said that they uh, followed the older couple 
to St. Louis, where their trail then went cold. And then the younger couple headed out west toward uh, Texas, and they were followed as far as Denton, Texas, and that's where their trail uh, pretty much went cold. You received uh, some information in, what, 2005, 2006, from one of your Uh, readers? After my book was was released, a lady contacted me. She bought my book, and she said, Do you know that there is a John and Katie Bender buried in Colorado? These two are the dates and and that age and all that. You might want to check into it. So to make the long story short, I did. Now, what makes you think that that, that, that's the John and Kate of, of this horrible John and Kate? By using census records... And then there is a, a Colorado booklet that was uh, it's at the Historical Society in Glenwood Springs. And I went through all this, and I'm reading this, and I just literally, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. They were of German ancestry. The age was perfect. Their description from the wanted posters, they came into uh, Glenwood Springs about five years after the Bender murders were exposed in Kansas. So this told me they went down into Mexico and hid out for several years and then gradually migrated up into Colorado Territory. Uh, John Bender was a blacksmith, and we know that uh, John Bender in, in Kansas was handled the horses and the uh, hammers that were found under the stove in the Bender kitchen in Kansas were blacksmith hammers. Katie, uh, he, he, they, bought a, they bought a business and started a tavern. John Bender did not live very long. He, he died just a few years later of something called dropsy of the heart. And the uh, locals seem to think that John was drinking heavily. And, and then it, it occurs to me, well, maybe Katie slipped him something. He died young, and Katie went on for another 30 years. She uh, lived until uh, uh, 1917, I, I think. And during her lifetime, she had uh, the tavern turned into a restaurant, and she became this entrepreneur. And if you can imagine... He was a poor blacksmith, and, and you know, suddenly she is, is buying property. She bought a ranch where she had an orchard, and then she bought a house in town. She was quite, for that time, turned into quite quite the business lady. And I'm thinking, you know, she was a business lady back in Kansas. And apparently she made a killing. Death for Dinner, The Benders of Old Kansas, written by Phyllis De La Garza. You can get a copy if you send her an email at P is in Paul, H Y L L M O R R at hotmail.com. We can check you out there. Phyllis, thank you yes. so much for joining us tonight. Yes. If you go to the Folly Theater on 12th Street in Kansas City, take a good look at the Usher. If she's wearing a long gown and in a hurry going down the aisle, she might be a well known ghost. Feel free to ask for Joe Donegan to complain. If he's there, he'll be wearing a bowler hat. He used to manage the Folly, still does occasionally from the grave vampires out werewolves passe witches oh please you know what's hot right now in the world of the macabre zombies <laughs> the problem is how do you celebrate zombies the whole year round michael spradlin has found the answer Mr. Spradlin is a New York Times best-selling author. He's got a Youngest Templar series that's sold in more than a dozen countries. He's been nominated for an Edgar Award. He's the winner of the Wrangler Award from the Western Heritage Museum and the National Cowboy Hall of Fame. And best of all, he's here with us tonight. Michael, you were able to combine two of my favorite holidays, Christmas and Halloween, in a way that I didn't really think was possible. It's your book. It's beginning to look a lot like zombies, a book of zombie Christmas carols. At what moment did you realize that Christmas carols would make great zombie anthems? Well, the, the genesis of that book actually began uh, many years ago when I was growing up. And as I often tell, uh, as you mentioned, my children's books, I speak a lot in schools and talk to students about reading and writing. And I tell them that the two greatest literary influences in my life are uh, John Steinbeck and Mad Magazine. No Sacred Cows, where Mad Magazine was. And they would they would take everything from uh, you know an episode of the television show Kojak and turn it into Beowulf, and uh, Starsky and Hutch would become a Broadway musical, and so I just found that hilarious. And so I had always wanted to do some type of parody book. And in 2008, I was at San Diego Comic Con, and I was walking the show floor, and everywhere I looked, I saw something zombie related: a T-shirt, a keychain. Uh, there were t- uh, zombie teddy bears, for heaven's sake. 
And I, I, as I looked around, I said, someone at some point is going to put the zombies and the holidays together, and that someone should be me. Now, if we go to HarperCollins.com, we can take a sneak peek into your zombie books. Also, you've got ZombieCarols.com. We can friend the undead on Facebook if, if people look for It's Beginning to Look a Lot Like Zombies. They list these these carols that just make me giggle. I saw mommy chewing Santa Claus. Uh, Good King Wenceslas tastes great. Uh, uh, that's probably, my favorite. I, I loved We Three Spleens. Well, if you uh, don't feel like decorating the Christmas tree with uh, sparkly entrails and singing Deck the Halls with parts of Wally, there's, of course, Valentine's Day that uh, you have zombified with every zombie eats somebody sometime. How much did you laugh while you were writing this up? The one that perhaps made me laugh the most in writing that particular book, Every Zombie Eats Somebody Sometime, was uh, uh, Tears, uh, My Fear of a Clown, which is sung to my Tears of a Clown, because uh, there's nothing more frightening than the idea of a zombie clown. A, clown, a zombie clown, when he's chowing down, that just cracked me <laughs> up. And uh, I laughed a lot during that one. And my mother still hasn't forgiven me for zombifying Dean Martin. Uh, and probably never will. The last book you've written in the series is Jack and Jill Went Up to Kill. Would you mind reading to us one of your favorite zombie nursery rhymes? I would be happy to do that. This is from the new book, Jack and Jill Went Up to Kill. And this is Zombie Simon. It goes like this. Uh, Zombie Simon ate the pie man going to the fair. Said Zombie Simon to the pie man, let me taste your hair. Said the pie man to Zombie Simon, show me first your penny. So Zombie Simon chomped the pie man, he tastes as good as any. What I love about that one in particular is that even though he was about to die, he wanted his penny. That entrepreneurial spirit could just not be uh, Absolutely. denied. Nothing's for you. Eat my brain, it's going to cost you, buddy. We can go to uh, zombiecarols.com for the carols, harpercollins.com to get a sneak peek into all your books. But you can check out all of my books at michaelspradlin.com. <laughs> As the saying goes, all good things must come to an end, although not all ends come to a good thing. Thank you for stopping by tonight at the Derelict Mansion on Macabre Hill. I'm Mark Lindsay, and it has been my pleasure to scare with you, I mean, share with you, these stories of the macabre. Happy Halloween, friends. Until I see you again. And I will see you again. <laughs> Macomb Hill is owned by Magnificent Cowlick Media, LLC. Produced in conjunction with Intercom Broadcasting, Kansas City.